happen to think it'll get pretty serious. They're ultimately going to have to decide, do we save the currency or do we save the bond market and the banking system? It's true today in Japan, in the UK, in Europe, in Turkey, and many other places around the world. This does not mean things are good in the United States. I just think it means that they are better in the United States than they are overseas. Historically, have these types of crises resulted in political change globally? Yes. Sides are being chosen. Rather than the world coming together, the world's kind of moving apart. You know, the dollar, if used correctly, is probably the biggest weapon we have, perhaps even greater than a nuclear bomb. Good evening. Welcome to NTD's Fresh Look America. I'm Paul Graney. The dollar milkshake theory made Brent Johnson famous in 2018. He predicted a global currency crisis, but said that the U.S. dollar, before it faced its own crisis, would rise significantly against other world currencies. It wasn't a popular opinion at the time, but it looks like that is exactly what is happening. Since 2018, the dollar is up 15% on the British pound, 15% on the euro, and 27% on the Japanese yen. Johnson says that the demand for dollars globally is huge. It is the world's reserve currency. People need it for international trade. And also, many outside the U.S. have taken out dollar loans, and the interest payments alone on that debt is huge. This is one reason why the U.S. government has been able to print so much new money recently without the dollar weakening versus other currencies. For background on the dollar milkshake theory, you can watch our previous interview with Johnson that was at last year's New Orleans Investment Conference. But today we'll focus on what a currency crisis would mean for America's position as the world's most powerful country. So Brent Johnson, thank you. It's great to speak with you. Thanks for having me back. Good to talk to you. So Brent, you're predicting a global currency crisis. How serious will it get and how will it affect regular Americans? Well, yeah, it, 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 how bad will it get? That's a very good question. I, I happen to think it'll get pretty serious. Um, that doesn't mean it's going to happen tomorrow. I actually think, you know, something as big as a currency crisis will typically take longer to fully play out um, than many others. And, and part of the reason I think that is once you get a currency in trouble or government bonds in trouble, you typically get reactions from monetary authorities, governments, central banks to try to quell the problem. And so I think they will probably do whatever they can to kind of kick this down the road. But, but I think we've kind of gotten to the point where they can no longer kick it too far. And so I do think that it, we will have a serious crisis. Are you expecting something akin to the financial crisis? Can you make some comparison there? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it's more akin to the currency crisis that we had, uh, you know, the Asian currency crisis in the late 90s or the number of currency crises that Argentina has gone through. Um, you know, what's happening, I think there's a lot of people perhaps in the U.S. who, who understand that the U.S. has borrowed too much money. Uh, we've run a budget deficit. We've run a trade deficit. You know, we've borrowed a lot of money at very low interest rates. We're never going to be able to pay it back. They're going to have to inflate the debt away. All of these arguments for, for how the U.S. has been too profligate, and at some point we're going to have to pay the price. And, and I do think that there's, there, there's truth in those arguments. But what I think a lot of people miss is that while that may someday be true for the United States, it's true today in Japan, in the UK, in Europe, in Turkey, and many other places around the world. So while it may be true for the US someday, it's already true for others today. And as a result, that's why you've seen the dollar rising so aggressively versus these other currencies. And so, you know, the, the governments and the monetary authorities of these other countries, whether it's the UK, whether it's Japan, uh, whether it's Sri Lanka, they're ultimately going to have to decide, do we save the currency or do we save the bond market and the banking system? History shows that governments try to protect both, but they ultimately have to choose one and they, cho and they choose to save the bond market and the banking system. And as a result, the currency falls a lot. And when the currency falls, that's when you get the currency crisis. So can you take some of these areas that we're seeing crises in at the moment and perhaps what we could expect to see in the United States if things play out in a similar way? Well, I think what you have to remember, well, if I give you an example, um, both Japan and Europe and the UK, um, they have borrowed a lot of money over the last 10 years, whether it's for bailouts, stimulus programs, however you want to define that. 
a lot of that was done at either very low interest rates or negative interest rates. Now, with inflationary pressures as a result of the COVID policies and the shutdowns and the uh, you know deglobalization and the, and the lack of supply, um, we're getting inflationary pressures, which the world has not had to deal with on a great scale for a very long time. That those inflationary pressures makes it harder to use the tools that were used in the global financial crisis to combat a global slowdown. So now we have a global slowdown and inflationary pressures. If they were to use the same policies they used coming out of the global financial crisis, it would exacerbate the inflationary pressures as opposed to fight them. So you're saying these central banks in the past and up until now have used inflationary measures to to combat crises, similar crises, but now we're seeing across the world, you know, record high inflation. You're saying it's not as easy. Is it impossible for them to use these? They risk, if I'm not mistaken, on one hand, exacerbating the inflation or on the other hand, you know, financial crisis. That's right. And, and, if, and if they do use these policies to combat um, the deflationary pressures and, and do exacerbate the inflationary pressures, then they're going to have a social crisis on their hand because the citizens are not just going to sit there and 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 accept record high inflation and and a decreasing standard of living. Uh, if you look back, I, I don't want to sound too overly dramatic, but if you look back at every revolution in history, it happened when people were out of work and they were hungry and they were cold. Well, right now we've got high inflation. People's are, are their jobs are not as secure, and uh, you know food prices are rising. You know, and energy prices are rising. So they're cold. They have the potential to be very cold this winter. They have the potential to be hungry and they have the potential to be very upset. And so I think, you know, t history shows that governments typically use financial repression to get out of an over indebted situation. What that means is they let inflation run hot and inflate the debt away. It works really, really well on a spreadsheet. You know, you, you hold rates low, you let inflation go high. You let inflation run at five or six percent for 10 years and you've just inflated away 50 percent of the debt works fantastic on a spreadsheet the problem is when you do that in the real world that's when people walk into out into the street with pitchforks right and politically it's not easy for politicians and governments and central bankers to just let inflation run wild it's much more difficult to do it in the real world than it is on the spreadsheet so you're saying that these policies have been you know, government deficits, rampant government spending has been happening for a long time. You're saying that governments have had ways to get a, a, around this um, through through um, various techniques, financial techniques. But this time it's different. So on one hand, they can keep printing money, let inflation run hot and risk people on the streets. You know, to me as a, as a somebody sitting here, but imagining a leader, okay, let's fix that problem. Let's not let inflation run hot. Let's not have people on the streets. But what are they trying to protect exactly? Well, they're trying to protect the status quo. They're trying to protect their jobs and they're trying to protect the economy from collapsing or from a currency collapse. Um, it depends on, it kind of depends on which country we're talking about, but you know, Powell, Jay Powell, the head of the Federal Reserve, um, has been extremely criticized to an extreme level for letting inflation run too hot, right? And so now he's kind of, for lack of a better word, he's mad. He's mad. He's upset that inflation got so high. And so now he's trying to, uh, he's trying his best to, to bring inflation down. He's trying to bring inflation down by crushing demand. And, and I think he will be more successful in that than people think he will be. If he wants to crush inflation, he can do it, but he'll have to crush the economy to do so. He literally said at the last meeting, you know, we need to have a recession that's going to bring pain. It may mean people having to lose their jobs and it may mean people having to get paid less. Now, that's not a very popular thing to say, but he but he said, I believe that that is a lesser evil than letting inflation continue to run away to the upside. So here's the point. Neither solution is good. You know, the, the central bankers and these monetary authorities have backed themselves into a corner and there's really no good solution out. And again, it goes to my point, you either save the bond market or you save the currency. And I think we're I think we're going to see a domino, a progression of dominoes where countries get put in this position of having to save the currency or save the bond market. I think they will initially try to save both. They will ultimately have to choose to save the bond market and the banking system, which means the currencies will fall. And then I think we get into a progression of the dominoes 
ultimately it will hit the United States, but I think that's a further, much further down the road. And I think it happens all over the world before it happens here. And again, this, this does not mean things are good in the United States. I just think it means that they are better in the United States than they are in overseas. So why do you think authorities will choose to save the bond market over the currency and allow this currency crisis to happen? What, what, what leads you to think this? Well, because history tells me that's what happens. Um, you know, from a government perspective, you would much rather have inflate away the debt than to have a collapse. You know, I think the interesting thing that, I, you know, if you if you talk to anybody in Germany, they have somebody in their family who lived through the Weimar inflation. And so the biggest fear that they have is the money losing value. If you talk to any American, they have somebody who lives in their family who lived through the Great Depression. In the Great Depression, money had incredible value because there were no jobs, there was no money. So the little money there was had great value. And so, you know, in America, we have always fought against deflation. In Europe or in Germany, they, they for 100 years have fought against inflation. And it, it both lead to ruin, both are horrible, um, but they're just different sides of the same coin.